This is really great. Thank you everyone so much for joining us for tonight's event. My name is Bree Hogue. I'm the store manager here at Powell City of Books in Portland, Oregon. You can check out our lineup of upcoming virtual events by visiting our website at powells.com. You can also check us out on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. If you pre-ordered a copy of Susan's book on animals, it will be available tomorrow, which is its publication date. Um, and if you ordered it to be shipped, it will be shipped tomorrow um, out to you at your home. Tonight, we're so honored to welcome Susan Orlean and Meg Wolitzer. Susan Orlean's new book is On Animals, a collection of 15 stories. One of our book buyers had this to say about On Animals. From tigers as household pets to show dogs, backyard chickens, and one very famous whale, Orlean is in fine form in this collection of essays detailing our various relationships to animals. As always, her prose is insightful, informative, and full of incisive metaphors. We're very excited about On Animals over here at Powell's Books. This book made our holiday list this year, Powell's Picks of the Season, and will be on display in our store starting tomorrow, uh, Tuesday, October 12th. Susan has been a staff writer at The New Yorker since 1992. She is the New York Times bestselling author of seven books, including The Library Book and The Orchid Thief. I'd also encourage you to follow her on Twitter at Susan Orlean. She's a very delightful tweeter. I highly recommend giving her a follow. Follow. Joining her in conversation tonight is Meg Wolitzer. Meg's many novels include The Female Persuasion, The Interestings, and The Wife. This evening's event will include a Q&A. Please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to ask a question. And you can support Susan Arlene and Powell's books by purchasing a copy of On Animals at Powell's.com. I'll share links in our chat tonight for both Susan and Meg's books. Susan Arlene Meg Wolitzer, thank you so much for joining us here on our virtual stage. It's a pleasure to host you. Well, thank you. And I want to say before we begin that I want to give a huge thanks to Powell's that um, besides being an incredible store, you've been so supportive of me all of these many years over many books. And this is my first event for on animals and it feels really fitting that I'm doing it at Powell's. So thank you guys so much. Yeah, it's a wonderful, wonderful store that I've loved coming to. Well, Susan, congratulations on the eve of your pub, of your pub date. This is so exciting. I know, I'm very excited. I don't know what the ritual is that you're supposed to observe on eve o pub date, but I'm gonna figure something out. There's that song I was going to ask you to sing tonight. <laughs> you know oh, it. yeah. <laughs> the EOPD song, you know. Yes, oh, yes, but we all, we all know it and sing it all the time. It's when we get together, that's what we do. <laughs> right. Now, um, I, I wanted to say before, I'm going to, I'd like to ask you in a minute to read a, just a little bit of kind of a mousse-bouche, like the free thing that you get at the beginning of the meal in the restaurant. But before we do that, I just had to ask you a couple of things. I, you know, I've known you for a really long time. Uh, gosh, I don't even know how many years it is, but I learned so many new things about you from this book. Um, I learned that uh, you play online Scrabble, which I do too. And I don't know why we're not doing that together. And I also learned that your first book was called Herbert the Nearsighted Pigeon, which we'll get to a little later. You were a child when you wrote it. Um, so with that, just with those little new bits of information, would you like to give us a little taste of the book and then we'll talk? Absolutely. So uh, this is from uh, the introductory chapter of the book, which is called Animalish. The art critic and philosopher John Berger once said that we like to look at animals because they remind us of the past and particularly of the agrarian life we used to lead that included the regular presence of animals. I agree, but I also think we look at animals because they're funny and companionable and interesting. Some of my animals have jobs. My chickens lay eggs. My dog scares the FedEx man. The cats, by their arrogant disregard of duty, serve to remind me that I have to schedule Terminex to come and chase the mice out of the basement. 
all of these creatures serve a purpose, even if that purpose is to have no real purpose other than to give a warm, wonderful, unpredictable texture to my life every day. I wouldn't have it any other way. I've wanted to write about animals as long as I've wanted to have animals. The first book I ever produced was a manuscript written in pencil on a scratch pad bound with staples called Herbert the Nearsighted, <clears throat> excuse me, Herbert the Nearsighted Pigeon. It was the story of a myopic pigeon who has relationship troubles on account of not being able to recognize his friends. I wrote the book when I was five years old. I'm not sure I was quite that young, but that's the family legend anyway. After Herbert, I wrote a million horse stories, mostly as an attempt to conjure a horse into my life. When I began writing professionally, I always had a soft spot for stories about animals. These always turned out to be stories about people as seen through their relationships with animals as much as they were about animals. Writing the animal part of these stories was challenging. People can be figured out, but animals are enigmatic. So the best we can do is to try to understand them through the lens of people living with them or using them or raising them or wanting them. That's great. Well, I'm sorry I stepped on your title. Oh. <laughs> But it's such, I mean, it just, it, it cracked me up when I, when I read that. And I wondered, in fact, were you the kind of child who read all those animal books like Misty of Chincoteague? Oh my God, yes. I mean, Misty of Chincoteague was, I think, the first book that I read and reread and reread. And I, I'm not talking about like Pat the Bunny and the books that you're, parents read to you when you were little. I'm talking about a book that I chose and read and read again and again and slept with it under my pillow. And it, coincidentally, it was a library book. I'm not sure I ever owned a copy of Misty of Chincoteague. I think I took it out of the library and took it out again and again and again. And I read all of those Marguerite Henry books. I you know, I wanted a horse so badly and I wanted a dog really badly. My family didn't have a dog. So I would read all of these dog books and just be in a fugue state, imagining what it would be like to have these animals in my life. Why didn't you have a dog? My mom was afraid of dogs. She thought that First of all, she was just, from the time she was young, she was afraid of dogs, but she also was a clean freak. And I think she thought, well, dogs are dirty and it'll, the house will be a mess if we have a dog. Right. My siblings and I really wanted a dog and thought we've got to figure out a way to sort of somehow convince my mom that we should have a dog. Right. And during that time, a lot of liquor was advertised with dogs. And for whatever reason, it was a very common trope in advertising. And there was a scotch, black and white scotch, that has as its logo a Scotty and a West Highland White Terrier. Do you remember the black and white? I don't even know if black and white scotch still exists. But we, in the ads, they had these beautiful, pure white West Highland Terriers. And we thought, well, this dog can't be dirty. It's so white. <laughs> this is, our logic was that it would somehow magically stay white, like a magic eraser or something. So we presented my mom with this ad and said, can we get one of these dogs? And believe it or not, my mother, who was so dead set against having a dog, I think saw this adorable white dog and said, okay. And, and certainly I'm sure my memory is partly filling in the blanks here, but my memory of it is that we went basically the next day and got one, which probably isn't quite true, but we got one soon thereafter, and you know the punchline to this is of course that my mother was so devoted to this dog 
she cooked him all his meals. She came home from work during the day to hang out with him and walk him. And she was completely smitten. And, you know, she would say she didn't like dogs in general, but she loved our dog. Right, right, right. Well, it's such a, but so that kind of chaos that she feared a, a dog would bring, have you welcomed that into your life? Because when I look at some of your own personal experiences with animals, you have to be a certain kind of person, for instance, to have chickens, um, to segue into your chicken life. Um, tell us about that. Having animals is chaos. I mean, having living things in your stewardship is, is you, you add a huge element of unpredictability. I mean, your dog, my dogs just got canine flu and were sick for two weeks and everything in my life was uh, revolving around take, taking care of my sick dogs. You know, it's a, it's a different level of possession to have a dog. And this was something that I first became interested in when I was writing The Orchid Thief. Plants are not animals, but plants are also these mutable, unpredictable things. You, it's not like collecting Hummel figurines. You know, you, you want to collect Hummel figurines, you buy one, you have it. And unless someone knocks it off a shelf, nothing's going to happen. But once you take into your life plants, animals, living things, you're surrendering a certain amount of control. And there are times when the chaos is overwhelming. I mean, we got a puppy during the pandemic because after I learned how to bake bread, I felt that was the natural next COVID activity was to get a dog. And so we now have two dogs and a cat. And there are times when I think we have, there are more animals in this house than there are people. And that, you know, they, they are the dominant species. I mean, the dogs and cats are different, but there are more animals than people. And, and there's a way that you, you have to just accept the, there's a certain amount of noise and disruption and mess and we have dog toys all over, over our house. And if you're a person who can't bear disruption, I don't think having a living thing in your care is a good idea. Was having animals a good prelude to having ki a kid? Oh yeah, I think so. Um, because you can't, you can no longer make decisions entirely on your own whim. I mean, you can't just say, hey, there are cheap flights to Las Vegas, let's just go. I mean, you have to figure out, all right, who's gonna take care of the dog and the cat? And, you know, there's a, a, a responsibility that you have that obviously isn't at the same level as having a child, but I, I haven't simply made a choice for myself without regards to any other human in, I can barely remember because, you know, I've had, I got a dog when I was in college. I waited longer to have the kid, but I did get the dog when I was in college. And I've had something to take care of for a very long time. Right. Well, I noticed with, with regard to dogs in college, you, uh, you have an observation that, of course, I've most many people have noticed, myself included, which is that why is it that dogs on college campuses always wear bandanas? Oh, always, why always. You, how did that start? I feel. <laughs> well, I think from you know having gone to college in the 1800s, I can say that it was very much. You know, I think it was like we're all hippies, including our dogs, and okay. so it was. And, yeah. And now the only time my dog has a bandana on is when he goes to the groomer and the groomer always puts a bandana on the dog. Oh, wow. And I always think it looks really cute and my husband cannot wait to get the scissors and cut it off the dog. But it was, um, you know, I think when you're young and frankly, I think getting a dog when you're in college is ridiculous and was a very stupid move on my part. 
easy. But you have you have gotten animals. Well, I really I am sort of very very interested in these chickens because we understand the desire for a dog, the cuddly thing, the sort of the thing that makes you feel good and you make it feel good. It's got this symbiosis perhaps, but what's the relationship? Tell me about how you got chickens. Um, I mean, it's in the book, but since our, our audience hasn't read the book yet, but will, I hope tomorrow. Um, what's, what do you, I, I, it's a multi-part question. As I said to you earlier, I would be tough, but fair tonight. Um, what, what brought you to, to get chickens and what is the, do you have a relationship to them? Do they have a relationship to you? I, well, I, I will answer all of your questions and starting backwards, which is to say, you do have a relationship with chickens, which seems unimaginable. I you think, do. Well, I think that if you have a number of chickens that's less than 12. Right. You have, you do have relationships with them. They're friendly. They're, I mean, some of them are less friendly, but I, you know, I think the way you measure it is at the point at which you stop naming them, you probably don't have a relationship with them. Um, but I, I knew my chickens very well. I knew their behavior. I, I knew who was the alpha chicken. I, I mourned their losses. I, I was, I had, a, and I was very surprised. I'd never been a bird person. And I never thought you could have a relationship with a bird. I just thought, well, they don't, you know, their faces don't seem expressive. How are you going to relate to a bird? But until I had a chicken, I didn't realize that you do have a rapport with them. How, and how did I come to have chickens? It's a question I ask myself often. I, I've always loved farm animals. I love livestock. I just love livestock. I think it's, I, I think livestock are so interesting because they're not pets. They're not the animals that live in your house, but they're not wild. So you have a relationship with livestock that's so interesting. It's like you've come to an understanding that you are mutually beneficial. And there's something about it that I find very moving and touching. So when we moved to our farm in the Hudson Valley in New York, I thought, well, I'm loading up the livestock. Like, now is my chance. This is, I'd been living in Manhattan for a very long time. Suddenly I had every opportunity to have pretty much any and every animal I could possibly want. And my long unrequited love for horses, I thought I'm going to, the first thing I get is a horse. Then I began taking stock of how much work it is to have a horse. And I, I got very nervous and I thought, well, I've got to downscale my ambitions. I'm going to get a goat. And I, I wasn't, I had no goals for the goat. I, I thought, well, maybe it'll eat some poison ivy, but mostly I just think goats are so cool to look at and and someone I know who had a lot of goats said, oh, they're great. They're really great fun to be around. And then someone else said, they'll bite you. They'll, they, they love to bite people's butts and they'll eat your car. And I got scared off and I thought, oh my God, you know, I, I don't want to lose either my butt or my car. I mean, it seemed like neither option was very appealing. Um, and I didn't know that much about goats. I knew that it was unlikely that I would be like milking the goat or making it useful to me in some way. And then I stumbled on this documentary called The Natural History of the Chicken. And this is the only time I think a movie actually changed the direction of my life. I saw this movie, which is all about chicken husbandry and people raising chickens and backyard chickens. And when that movie ended, I thought I, I'm getting chickens. I mean, they're, 
they're not, they're small. I'll be able to manage them. They'll give me eggs, which is amazing. And, and they're, um, they're beautiful. I mean, I never thought of a chicken as being attractive, but in this movie where they show you all of these cool heritage breeds of chickens, I thought, oh my God, they're so pretty. I want, I want those. And so it kind of came out of nowhere. I remember mentioning it to my parents who were utterly mystified. I mean, you know, the idea of trying to reclaim some agrarian lifestyle was very disturbing <laughs> to my parents. You watched, I get uh, a woman perform mouth to beak resuscitation as you were. Yes, to well, they did a, a very good reenactment. Um, her chicken had frozen to death in a terrible snowstorm. She didn't give up on the chicken, even though it was frozen stiff she brought the chicken in the house and the chicken was <laughs> really frozen stiff. Like its feet were stuck out and it was, it didn't look good. And she thought, well, I'm going to put it near my wood stove and start doing mouth to beat resuscitation and who knows. And the chicken eventually thawed out and came back to life. And it was very moving <laughs> and fair. And it made me think if you can freeze a chicken and resuscitate it, I think this is the livestock for me. Well, I, you know, when you, you, you've used the word moving a couple of times, and I think that that's really so much a part of being with animals, isn't it? It's just so moving because they can't tell us things, but they tell us in other ways sometimes. But aren't you moved constantly by just by how different we are from them? Well, when people have said to me, a sort of two-pronged question, why write about animals, but also why are you so interested in animals? I always think, well, if Martians landed on Earth, wouldn't you be really interested in them? I mean, they're alien beings. They We don't speak the same language, but it's clear that they have communication among themselves and they have some sort of culture and a sense of dignity and I would, I would want to get to know Martians and getting to know animals or observing animals or more to the point as journalists observing people observing animals right. is an opportunity to in a sense simplify what you're observing because it's not people interacting with people as much as a more um, unilateral kind of relationship. But, you know, these stories are ultimately as much about the people as they are about the animals. And observing people interacting with this alien kind of life form tells you a lot. And, you know, the emotions we feel have big swings when it comes to animals. And I, you know, when I was working on Rin Tin Tin, one of the things that I found most interesting was um, the discovery that a, a diagnostic feature of a mental illness is an inability to feel empathy yeah. to, toward animals, that it's so fundamental to being human to be able to feel something. I'm not saying liking animals because there are lots of people who don't like animals. And, and that doesn't mean, that's a, a, just a personal dis difference between people who do like animals, but the ability to feel some empathy toward them is very much kind of um, wired into our capacity to feel and and particularly to feel for species that are lesser than we are. And you know, the other interesting point on that to me is the fact that in Blade Runner, the test to tell whether someone was human or a replicant was showing them a I think it was a butterfly dying in a, in a um, bell jar. And 
people would be disturbed by it, but the replicants would just observe it and didn't have a, an emotion about it. And that's how they were sort of revealed to be non-human. So there, there is something very deep in us that responds to animals in a way that it's different from the way we, we, that we respond to people for sure. You know, they, there was some study where they showed um, a bunch of preschoolers one-celled organisms. So these are one-celled animals under a microscope and asked them to comment on what they saw. And these little children said, you know, made a narrative out of it. That one's the funny one. That one's the mommy. That one's the daddy. I don't know if we're just also so hardwired for narrative, for story. Because yeah. Isn't that part of it? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, I think that we all do this with our pets or with, you know, you go to a zoo, you see an animal and you have a reaction. He looks sad. He looks bored. He looks lonely. I mean, we, we have trouble imagining that a living thing doesn't have a narrative. And you have this great line about the chickens. You say, when you pick up one of your antisocial chickens, you write, quote, they eye me with such deep suspicion that I feel like they can smell omelets on my breath. <laughs> which is just so great. The deep suspicion in those little eyes of a chicken. The, the, the little, by the way, the only thing, and this will sound gross, but the only thing that made me feel better about this is chicken's favorite treat is eggs. And I discovered this by accident because I was collecting eggs for my chickens and dropped one and it broke. And the chickens were like, yay, this is the best treat we've ever had. And I thought, oh my God, this is here, doesn't it? Didn't that shock, it's shocking in some way. It shocked me, it totally shocked me. I yeah. mean, you feel like, oh, that's, seems what wrong. does that even mean? It seems, it seems really icky, but it's on the a other hand, you know, it's a protein source and animals number one goal is to thrive and survive. So Maybe they thought, well, I guess we're having eggs for breakfast. So great. Well, let's move to a couple of the other animals in this book. And there are so many. Um, in your piece, The Lady and the Tigers, this is a, a different kind of relationship that someone has with animals. Um, talk about that, ti uh, that woman, Joan Byron Marasek. This was a... Um a pretty disturbing story. It was, it had its, you know, moments of weird humor, but what, in short, what happened was one day in a suburb in New Jersey, someone saw a tiger walking through town and this tiger roamed through the town for most of a day. They attempted to tranquilize it um, and unsuccessfully, unfortunately, ended up having to kill the tiger because it had wandered over to an elementary school. The first order of business among the animal control officers was to figure out whose tiger was this. Now you would imagine that the, the number of answers to that question would be few and far between. I mean, this was a suburb, kind of a suburb of Trenton. Yeah. Six Flags had, um, you know, an amusement park that had animals in the area, but they did a head count and they had all of their tigers. So it wasn't one of their tigers. And lo and behold, it emerges that a woman who lived in town in the middle of a subdivision actually had 27 tigers. They were not permitted they were, she had a permit for, I believe, five tigers that she claimed uh, she was using for educational purposes, although in fact she wasn't. Right. Over the years, she added more and more tigers and some of her tigers had babies and she ended up with, she didn't know how many she had. I mean, when the animal control officers arrived, she, she had no idea how many tigers she had. Well this began to unfold in a very complicated way the entire story of how the state had never made note of 
all of these tigers, but also her own pathology as a, an animal hoarder, which there's no question that that's that she was a hoarder. But this also took me into a lot of other reporting that was fascinating and disturbing, such as the discovery that it's not very hard to get a tiger. And, you know, my first thought was, oh, my God, how how did anyone ever get a tiger? Well, it's not very hard. It's um, unfortunately, the exotic animal trade is very poorly regulated. Now with the internet, it's even easier to get these exotic animals. And it was really shocking. Um, just I mean, it was one of the most interesting stories I did, obviously, with a pretty dark aspect to it. But it was a fascinating look into this whole world of hoarding. And, and also, there was a way in which this was also a little bit about this strange phenomenon of the area where she lived in. When she moved there, it was basically rural. There was nothing there. And she could have tigers and no one knew and no one noticed. And over the years, it got more and more developed. And then there was a big subdivision that was built basically surrounding her house. But the people in the subdivision had no idea that there were 27 tigers loose in the area behind their houses. So it was, I mean, I would be shocked if I found out that my neighbor had 27 tigers and they were shocked. But there's also a larger shock too, which is that you say you, you were shocked yourself to learn there are more tigers in captivity than in the wild. Yeah, and, th and that was, I mean, this story was one that I could have worked on for, if it, if it hadn't been so depressing, I, I could have even imagined writing a book about it. But Tigers actually, you know, there, there are very few tigers in the wild and they are in, in every instance considered endangered. Yeah. But in captivity, tigers, oddly enough, breed very easily in captivity. A lot of animals don't, they do. And we have many, many tigers. I mean, probably no one listening can think of a zoo that they've ever gone to that didn't have a tiger because tigers are an easy animal to breed and for zoos to obtain. Right. In a way, we have too many tigers in captivity because zoos let them breed and then they don't have anything to do with the additional tigers. So it's it's a really um, unfortunate situation. And we can't repatriate these tigers to the wild. You know, once they've been raised in captivity, they generally are not able to be released. And in addition, there's not enough habitat for them to be wild. And that really is the bottom line on a lot of these stories is that wild animals are limited now by the habitat available to them, which is shrinking literally every day. Yeah, because that, ha that happens in at least two of the, these pieces that you find that the animal can't, you know, there's this sort of fantasy that we've always had of returning an animal to the wild and that can't really happen so safely. Right, um, right. And, and, you know, it, it is done in some cases successfully, I think, um, birds are often able to be released into the wild, but a lot of these predators, once they've been accustomed to being around humans, are not, they really don't know how to be wild anymore. But more to the point, there's nowhere to release them. And right. that's very much part of my, the story I wrote about the, the lion whisperer. Um, and the situation in South Africa where there are too many lions in captivity and not enough lions in the wild. Right. Um, let me just interrupt here to say we're going to take questions. So anytime you have them, please put them into the Q&A and I will ask, uh, ask Susan your questions. Well, speaking of lions, while we wait and see if people have some questions, you have this, will you tell the story about John, your 
husband when he was your boyfriend? Uh, <laughs> this is actually such a bizarre story. Um, we were about to celebrate our first Valentine's Day together. And, you know, it was full of of import and I thought oh I wonder what he's going to do for Valentine's Day he said to me well I've gotten us tickets to see the Lion King and I thought oh that's really sweet that's like a really lovely Valentine's Day gift and he said but they're not for Valentine's Day it's for later on so he said I let's just hang out then he said to me well um my friend his best friend's name is Rick Lyon he said Rick's going to come over um and I thought, oh, well, that that's kind of a drag. I mean, for Valentine's Day, you're going to have a friend come over. It just seemed really not cool. But I thought, all right, look, I'm not going to be bratty about it. And he came over and I had dressed up. I thought I want to look as pretty as I can look. And he looked me up and down and he said, um, you know, you should put on something more casual. And I thought, all right, that's weird. So I went and changed and something cute, but casual. And I came out and he said, oh no, I mean like really casual, like just, you know, like a sweatshirt or something. And I thought, well, all right, I'm pissed now officially. Like, I don't get it. This is not romantic. I'm not happy. And I was sort of sulking. And then he rolled up all my rugs and I thought, you know, this is really annoying and well, you know, I'm breaking up with him as soon as tonight is over. And then the doorbell rang. And he said, I'll get it, I'll get it. And the door opens and in walks a two-year-old African lion. On a, and he was on a leash and there were two off-duty cops guarding him and his handler. And he was there, this was my Valentine's Day surprise, full of all the puns that, that John had built into this reveal. And I, I can't even describe to you my reaction. I mean, what would be your reaction if a lion walked into your apartment? But I'll tell you the funniest thing, besides the fact that I could not believe there was a lion in my apartment and I got to touch it we fed him two raw chickens, which he swallowed whole. Oh um, then it was time for the lion to go. And, you know, I was living in New York City in an apartment building on the ninth floor. And I said, oh, can I ride down with the lion? Because I wanted my last few minutes with the lion. And this thing was scary, by the way. I say he's two years old, but he was about 200 pounds and pure raw energy. So we get on the elevator and the elevator starts going down and then it stops on the fifth floor and the door opens and it's one of my neighbors. And she was a little bit of a sort of whiny woman. And I said, oh, excuse me, um, it's, do you mind waiting for the next elevator? She said, well, I'm in a hurry. And I said, well, but we have a lion in here. And she said, oh, all right, fine. <laughs> <laughs> so good. That's just so good. Oh um, my God, it was so funny. We got down to the lobby and there were probably 200 people in the lobby of the building because our doorman had started telling everybody, oh my God, there's a lion in the building. And it, it, was, it was pretty amazing. The next Valentine's Day, John warned me and said, I can't bring a lion every Valentine's Day. You, ha you have to understand, it might just be a bouquet and chocolates. So <laughs> we've done our best. Although often we do have an animal themed Valentine's Day, it probably is a bit of an homage to the days of yore. Well, there are some people in your book who are interested not in animals sort of living their best lives, but animals post life, because you have this incredible, uh, piece, this essay on called Lifelike, and it's and it deals with the World Taxidermy Championship and taxidermy itself. I'm curious because like, so are these animal lovers? Yes. And, you know, I think that's a very um, legitimate question. And it was one, honestly, that I had when yeah. I went to report the story. 
I mean, dealing with dead animals, that's what they do. And many of their clients and customers, I should say, are hunters. You know, that's where a lot of taxidermy work comes in is people have killed something hunting and they want a trophy made of it. So I thought, well, I wonder if they, these are people who don't like animals and it, it couldn't have been less the case. They love animals. They study animals. They think about animals. A few of them actually kept a small herd of deer because a lot of their work involves mounting deer trophies. And so they want to really be able to study the way a deer looks right. um, and its expressions. And they, they absolutely love animals. And it, I'm, I mean, there was one of my favorite stories in the book. I went into it partly out of sheer astonishment because I had no idea that taxidermy um, existed in, as a, a booming profession. I mean, you don't, it's not every day that you run into a taxidermist. So I had come across a taxidermy supply catalog that was like five inches thick. And I thought, wait a minute, this makes no sense. I mean, nobody does taxidermy. This is crazy. And of course, that couldn't be further from the truth. It's actually a thriving industry. And well, lucky for me, the championships were taking place, um, you know, a few days after I discovered that taxidermy catalog. Well, you have uh, quotes from this message board or chat room on taxidermy.net, which is very quickly people say, I'm in need of several pairs of frozen goat feet. Thanks, Tim. Hi, Tim. I have up to 300 sets of goat feet and up to 1,000 set of sheep feet per month. Drop me an email at frozencritters.com. So there's, <laughs> there's this whole sub community, like all, well, of course the world is filled with that, right? Like Yeah, well, and that's, a, of course, that's something that I, I live for those subcultures. And, and the fact that this was, you know, this is something that some of us might be squeamish about. I would be squeamish about goat feet, but it's treated very, matter of factly like well I'm trying to do a really beautiful stuffed goat and I need like really good feet for my goat and I mean no squeamishness obviously and a reverence for the beauty of the animal and the desire to recreate in in this taxidermy form the beauty of the animal when it was alive I mean no taxidermist wants their animal to look dead, they want it to look alive. And I mean, it was a amazing experience. We have a couple of questions. Um, so John asks, have you happened to learn, not your John, have you happened to learn at what level of species nervous systems development that animals suffer or feel pain? Um, I don't have that answer and that there's a lot of research done on that. And in fact, I, I mentioned this in my story about the uh, people, the film and television unit of American Humane and the people who oversee animals that are used in film and television. And they were at the time of the story, um, there was some new research emerging about whether fish can feel pain in their lips. And the reason this mattered was, you know, if you're fishing with a hook, you're hooking the, the mouth of the fish. And it was always believed that fish didn't feel pain in their lips. So American Humane was interested in finding out whether this was true or not, because if it turned out that they do feel pain, then it would no longer be permitted in a film uh, to show actual fishing. Right. But I, I'm not in any way a, a zoologist or a scientist. So I, I would have only come across that as a reporter and I, I didn't happen to find that the answer to that. Um, Beth is asking, have you thought of doing a talk with the author of Fuzz, Mary Roach? Her book is about human wild animal interactions. Yes, she and I talked about it. She's a friend of mine and I, I, I admire her work so much. And her book came out 
quite recently, I think maybe a month ago. Um, and I, maybe we will still get a chance to do that because I think she's still doing events and she's great. So that would be really fun. Oh, that sounds great. Um, so now there are some tweets, some tweets, sorry, some questions that are not necessarily related to animals. So we can segue because I wanted to actually also talk to you even just a little bit more generally about writing stuff because I think, I think people always like hearing that. But here's just the remaining non-animal related questions for the moment. Can you make a book of your drunk tweets, Heather asks? Oh, well, uh, I actually looked into it, believe it or not, because so many people said, I want that as a book. And, and I thought, oh my God, if this, you know, <laughs> I mean, it, it was writing and I'm, I, I own all my writing in the sense of, I take ownership of my writing. Um, so I was amused and slightly like freaked out <laughs> by the thought of that. But I think, you know, who knows? Could still happen. Life is long. Life is right. long. Um, and Sonali says your office is gorgeous. How did it come about? Oh, well, thank you. Um, this is out in my courtyard. It's a freestanding building, which I am uh, really grateful to have. I, I live in Los Angeles and this was a little building that was originally a screened in sort of patio. And when we bought the house and we were doing a ton of renovation on the house and we realized if we glassed it in and put in proper heat and a roof, it could be a, an office. And I, I, I really love it. Um, it's important to me to have a little space that's just my own so that I can, I can concentrate and work uninterruptedly. So I'm curious in terms of your work, because I mean, I'm a fiction writer through and through, and you are a nonfiction writer through and through. And I think they are, they're different in obviously many, many ways, but because you do reporting, how do you know when, the story's ready to start writing? How do you know when you're done doing the legwork or interviews? I, I honestly genuinely have no idea how you would know. Well, and I, it's a great que question because I think it's a really essential question. Um, you know, when I enter a story and I'll use the taxidermy one as a perfect example, I knew nothing, nothing about taxidermy, about the industry of it, nothing. So in the beginning, I, I, didn't, I had to be a sponge. I basically was doing a crash course in learning everything I could about taxidermy, observing this world championship, talking to people. I was a student. Then there was a moment where my learning curve started to flatten out and I was beginning to hear things I already knew. And realizing that, oh, I, I, I already know that. And I'm learning a little less new stuff every day. Then there's a really distinct moment where I began to feel like I could teach the subject. And I don't mean in a professorial way, but that I had learned enough that I had the confidence to turn to readers and say, let me tell you about this amazing, crazy world that I've discovered. So it's, it's an intuitive click that happens where you go from being a student to feeling you can be a teacher. Well, and I, a, I really, oh, that's, pardon me. That's wonderful. I, that's a wonderful way to describe it. So you basically would be able to tell people where you could get the frozen goat feet. That's sort of when you right. Know. Right, or what you would use them for, or I mean, and. It's interesting because I find myself talking to people a lot about my stories as I'm reaching that point of immersion because I feel fluent in it. And, you know, it's almost <clears throat> like learning a new language. There's a moment where you, you feel like you can actually venture a couple of sentences. No, and it feels... No. Yeah, so Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean to. Yeah, that. but I, I mean, it's it's something where you feel intuitively that you're ready, that you you can take a chance. But pound for pound, which is deeper pleasure for you, writing or reporting? God, you know, 
they are so different. I mean, reporting is so much fun. It's all external. You're talking to people, you're digging, you're learning. Um, you know, sometimes it's, it's very overwhelming and you, you're struck by the extent of your ignorance and how much you need to learn. And it, it can be daunting. Yeah. But writing when you're in the groove is so satisfying and you're making something where nothing was. And, and it's, you know, in that sense, it's probably very much like exactly the same feeling you have where you feel the, the sort of potency of being a creator and making something new. And I love words and I love when I put a few words together and they sound really good. And, but it's almost two completely different jobs. I'm kind of glad that I have them both. No, it's wonderful. I mean, I always say to students uh, when I teach, if you're stuck, if you're blocked, find a passage in a book where you know that the writer was in that groove, where they got so excited about what they had just done, you know, where they did the little Snoopy dance around to give another sort of outdated animal related reference <laughs> and get, and just feel their excitement. And then maybe yeah. you'll find your own, maybe you'll find your own. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that's a perfect, um, I mean, when I'm stuck or if I have students who are stuck, I, I always say, don't look at your own work. Right. Go to the work that you think is really good and, and look at it and go, whoa, look at the way they nailed this transition or this description and, you know, sort of wallow in all of the, you know, oh, my dog is barking now. A perfect timing. Um, and where you knew the writer was saying, I got this, I, I got this right. I know, this, and there's something about, it's, okay, we were talking earlier about the relationship, the sort of strange, almost nonverbal relationship that we have with animals. I think that there's a relationship between readers and writers that is similar. We're on a, you know, we don't know them in the same way, but it's like, you're, you're looking at other books, you know, that somebody yeah. else, and you have a relationship to it and you're excited about it. And I think that happens when we're writing all the time. Yeah, well, I feel lucky that I have, I feel as if I can feel what a reader would experience right. reading my work. And I feel, I, I, think, I think I'm really fortunate to have that, that. And I think in nonfiction, it's particularly important because you're, you're introducing people to a lot of material yeah. that they, they don't know and you need to feel your way through it as if it's new to you as well. And that, that's um, a big challenge. No, totally. Another is asking, how do you come across these stories and subcultures? I'm just always looking, always listening, eavesdropping, looking at specialty <laughs> magazines, um, following on mentions people make here and there, <laughs> read, reading, the little stories in the newspaper. Um, you know, I feel like finding stories is one of my sort of job requirements that I need to be always having my eyes open. And sometimes it means looking at something very familiar and saying, wow, a library, wow, I never thought about it before, but maybe there's an interesting story to write about a library. So it's not always just the exotic and odd thing. It's sometimes something very familiar that you stop and think, oh, if I looked at this differently, it could really be interesting. And totally. And speaking of libraries, um, two questions related to children's literature. Did you, I'm trying to answer this myself, but I want you to answer first. Did you read the book? Pinkie Pie and Pinkie Pie by Eleanor Estes? No, um, I, I'm not familiar with them. And I'm going to let my dog in here. Don't go away, folks, because he's barking maniacally. All right, come on in. But I absolutely love them, and I can picture the and Sorry about that. Um, no, um, and she wrote the Moffat Families, uh, the Moffat Family books. Does that ring a bell to you? Not so much. Oh, 
Meet the Moffats. This is like, I'm pulling this from my early life, but, oh, you would love these books. These are great children's books from the past, but also did you read Beverly Cleary's Ramona the Pest or Henry Huggins, both of which the dog Ribsy plays a prominent role. Yes, absolutely. And <clears throat> I also tried to get my son interested in reading them. He, he read a lot of dog books, but those, he just didn't happen to read those. But I remember those books. And, you know, it's no accident that so much of children's literature um, focuses on animals because there's a, an innate kind of connection between kids and animals that is so rich for children and the characters can be so non-judgmental and they're not parents and they're not you know they're they're a neutral but very appealing party that's right and the first book i ever cried at was charlotte's web you know oh. the, the death of a spider is just a wild thing um absolutely. yeah i mean th those are you know, some of the books that we um, are most affected by and feel the most emotional about are center, center around animals. I mean, who doesn't have a little beat of their heart when they think about Old Yeller? I mean, for a lot of kids, that was one of the first books they ever read that dealt with death in any real way. I mean, as well as Charlotte's Web. There's that website for, about movies. Does the dog die in it or something like, isn't that right? Isn't that the name of a website? Oh yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. to see because I remember that, um, so that line, every dog is a sad story waiting to happen or something like that, but there's this built into caring for an animal is the end of the animal's life perhaps, right? Yeah, well, there's a, I, I wrote about that a little bit because um, I lost my dog during the course of, working on some of these pieces and it's a it's a very particular ache um and when you get a dog you know that you're likely to outlive them and that that's that's a a compromise we make emotionally knowing that there will be sadness um in the relationship for right. sure right um, we have time just for one or two more quick questions because it's just about time to go. But and Jeff, I'm gonna pick up my dog, so he stops barking. Jeffrey says, "Can you hear me while I read this?" Um, Jeff, we loved having you in Alaska in 2019, which seems so long ago. Our pigs in Daia are still not reproducing. Do you have any suggestions? Well, as a pig expert, I can say. I don't, but I would love to come back to Alaska, and I love pigs, so I'm happy to come visit with your pigs. Last question from me. What kind of a dog is your dog, and what's your dog's name? This is Buck, and he is a smooth fox terrier, um, and he's one year old, and oh, he, he was our pandemic puppy, and he is a handful, but he's, he's a good dog. They're all good dogs. They are. They are indeed. Well, listen, Susan, this book is just so marvelous, everybody. I, it's just, it's really quite, again, there's that word moving. It's just moving your, your, your non-judgmental relationship to, you know, human and animal subjects, uh, to just everyone you look at, talk to, learn about their lives. I just learned a lot myself reading this book and I laughed too, quite a good deal. It's really, really witty. Um, Thank I want to wish you a wonderful virtual book tour mostly at this point right weird having a book out in a pandemic I guess yeah. that was going to happen yeah but you know I I'm so happy that we've got this crazy technology that lets us still meet and talk to readers and and be part of the world at large from, from our little room and my dog is definitely causing ear splitting bark so sorry about that everyone no no no. he's gonna get us off stage right now because i think we have reached our end but thank you everybody for coming and please buy susan's book which is absolutely wonderful congrats susan <laughs> Yes, Thanks, thank you so much to Susan and Meg for being here. The new book is on animals. It's available on Powell's.com. I just dropped a link in our chat um, and you can stop by the store anytime this week to grab a copy. Thank you so much for being here. It was really great to host you. you.
And I really hope that we can welcome you both back in person um, for your next books. I would love it. Thanks a million. Thanks, Meg. And thank you everyone for coming. I really appreciate it. Have a good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night.